The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to show number 36 of As We See It, being recorded on Sunday, April 1st, 2012. Joining us today is our original, usual panel here from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Ed Jupin. Out there in the Pocono Mountains, we have Fred Boaz in St. Louis, Missouri, Holly Hurley, and in Brookline, Massachusetts, The Lobster. Hello, everybody. Hey, hello. Well, hello. And to get started today, we have a follow-up on a story I did a couple of weeks ago about cell phone tracking that's being used by police as a routine tool. And the ACLU is going after this because they, they feel it's a violation of, your, of people's civil rights. Law enforcement is saying that it's a good, a good law enforcement tool. And if used properly, I can see where it is. But I have a problem with them randomly using this and not having any kind of restrictions on it. Cause they, it can be abused and, and, and maybe. So it's what find what everybody else thinks. Well, um, I mean, you know, the actual, the story we covered a while back was about a GPS tracker that, that was actually put on someone's vehicle without their knowledge during a routine procedure on their car, if you will. Um, whereas this is more when people, like if you watch movies, which I definitely do, or Law and Order or something, you know, they'll say, oh, we're tracking that call. I can see the connection, which scares me, is that the lines blurred a little bit on this one. But I don't really see it being the same violation of privacy as, say, a GPS tracker, because typically they utilize this like in child abduction cases when people are calling to try and negotiate the ransom or when you're calling 911, they're trying to find where your call is coming from. And that sort of thing makes perfect sense to me. And there's probable cause in every And even if they want to try to use it to follow up, to track down a fugitive or something, same thing. That makes sense. And along the lines of, I guess... The comparison that you're trying to make, everybody from the earliest days of cell phones or any of this type of two-way technology realizes that there's the chance that it could be tracked or pinpointed down your location and so on and so forth. People even say that about any kind of smart cards, whether it's a mass transit system smart card or easy pass type toll payment systems easy pass was a was a there was a huge controversy over that when it first came out 10 15 years ago in the new york new jersey area about people saying well okay these transponders not only give my payment information to pay for my toll but now it's going to track how much time it took me to get from point A to point B, and then I could potentially get a uh, speeding ticket in the mail. Yeah, you could. So it all ties together. That's I, I think the general public is probably aware that any device that's a transponder or a two-way communication device, the possibility of it being tracked is there. Oh no, no. my con my concern isn't that so much. It's a fact. I just want to make sure that at, you know, right now I have Easy Pass. We all have cell phones. They can track us, which is fine. I just want to make sure that the, that the, if the police are going to use it, let them use it for rescue tools. Try to find someone. If you're trying to locate a kidnapper or whatever, that's all fine. I don't care if they track my Easy Pass and see how long it took me to get from point A to point B. If I'm speeding, I get caught. Okay, fine. I just want to make sure it's not being used randomly in the wrong hand. Right now it isn't, but it could be. We don't know. And that's my only concern. Well, and I think, I mean, I don't think people have, I think it would just be a waste of time to really just track people's cell phones all the time because knowing where they are is no indicator necessarily of what they're doing. You know, the whole, the difference between this and a GPS tracker that's been planted without your knowledge is they're actually putting a piece of equipment on something you own without your knowledge as opposed to tracing a phone call that you made to someone or that someone made in your presence to put you in danger and so I actually think it's a very different thing and also you know the the point that's being made in the the article that we used which was from the New York Times was that a, crim a criminal analyst says you know we find people and it saves lives and I have no doubt that that's true and I just think it is a very different thing and I think kind of like Ed was saying if you start looking if you start taking away the right to trace a call that's being made in order for someone to get help 
then you also really have to look into everything that that's used to regulate anything that we pay for that's also used to regulate us, like our easy pass or things like that. And th I just don't think that that's valuable. I think that's a waste of time that could be used to actually do something better. Larry? What I read about the thing with the cell phones and using that to track you is that it's the police are doing that without getting a court order. Well, when you have someone who's who's called in, or say in the case of a 911 call. Well, it's not only a voice call. It's using the GPS on the phone. It's tracking the phone itself, not a voice call. Right. And if they're, and if they're using them without court order, then that case is going to get thrown out in court anyway. That's right. the job of the judge doing the trial. No, and that's what I'm talking about. That as long as they have a court order or justify, I just don't want some cop. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Holly. I think that no. potentially will get thrown out just like that GPS car case got thrown out by the court. And that, let's just hope but it does. But if they're tracking you for a child abduction and they don't get a court order for it and they find the child, who the heck cares? The sure. kid's with his parents now. It served a good, it can only do good in pretty much every situation I can think of. In my mind, I'm like, I, I don't really see... It still comes down to if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about. Right, well, and people, most people who, are, who have cell phones who are in this situation are smart enough to use burners or whatever the case is so they can throw it out and get mm -hmm. away. Right. So, and I mean, it's unfortunate that I'm probably giving some criminal out there an idea, but... The oh, they, no, they, is, they're more than aware of that. I mean, if they're idiotic enough to get caught this way, then good. More power to, to the police who are trying to save some lives and do some good. I don't know. I don't usually feel that way about these things, but I definitely feel this way about this one. Well, before we go on too much longer, how about lobster tails, Larry? Little lobster tail action. Okay, here we go. First lobster tail in the team of Kansas. It's illegal to throw knives at men in striped suits. Hey. Well, I hope so. Where'd you find that out? Isn't it just illegal to throw knives at people in general? Isn't that like a, isn't that some sort of assault or <laughs> attempted murder? Could be. Okay, number two. Dogs and cats are either right-handed or left-handed, or is that pause? Uh-huh, um, uh-huh, uh-huh, cute. I got nothing to say about that. <laughs> it would exactly. be I don't know, if they have a pen she had a right? Yeah, right? Like, if they don't have opposable thumbs, like, what are they going to do with one hand or the other that they can, you know, because they need all four paws interacting with the ground to do most things. <laughs> Perhaps pinning down an animal that they're hunting, like a squirrel or a rabbit, but that's the only time I could think that'd be valuable. Number three, nose prints are used to identify dogs just like fingerprints are used to identify humans. That's adorable. Well, that actually sounds I like that one. I just think that's adorable. I mean, I, I couldn't see it being helpful in a case where a dog has done injury to someone because I can't imagine they would actually leave a quote-unquote nose print in that case. But I just think it's so cute that, you know, so if somebody was looking for my dog and they were like, well, that looks like her dog, they could compare the nose print. It's just so cute. It's like a baby's footprint. Yeah, what I like is the fact that, I mean, it, my, I mean, my dog has a chip that they can run a thing over, but you have to know the dog is gone. But that's I like. I think that's a great idea, though. Okay, number four. America once issued a five-cent bill. The five-cent bill was issued in 1861 by the state of North Carolina while a part of the Confederacy. It was only three inches wide. Now, my problem with that is how did South Carolina issue an American bill when they were in the Confederacy? They well, didn't. They issued a Confederate bill. It was North Carolina. Okay. What does that have to do with South Carolina being in the Confederate? Let's see. Anyway, but bank at one time before the Federal Reserve System, states issued out their own bill. No, what I'm saying with this lobster tail here is that it says that America once issued a five cent bill in 1861 by the state of North Carolina while part of the con Confederacy. I see. All right, I see where you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What, is, what I think we're trying to say is that the North Carolina was not part of the United States. It was part of the Confederacy, so the U.S. did not issue a five-cent bill. Did not, the right. Confederacy it was, did. It was, it was worded improperly then. Yeah, okay. And, and, that made, and that makes a lot of sense. Confederacy money devalued very, very quickly throughout the course of the war. Ultimately, before the war was even over, it had no monetary value whatsoever. And continues to have none today. Right. Exactly. Uh, they're, they're out there. You can find Confederate bills and literally the saying, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. The thing is that people don't understand, like I was saying before, is at one time, every state and a lot of banks at one time 
were able to issue their own money. Money was not good in a lot of places from state to state, which is why the Federal Reserve System came through. And you've heard the expression, queer is a $3 bill. At one time, a $3 bill was issued by the St. Nicholas, Nicholas Bank of New York. And believe it or not, they had Santa Claus as the picture on it. So little tail there, but... So back to number one. I'm intrigued with being illegal to throw knives at men in striped suits. Um, Fred brings up a good point. Wouldn't it be illegal to throw knives at almost anybody or Holly, whoever brought that up? Why just in striped suits, I wonder? I mean, one of those laws was written years ago about you know certain types of people at the time in the team of Kansas might have been wearing striped suits. It might have been to signify a prisoner or might have been a certain class of people, certain class of individuals, and for whatever reason, they made it illegal. So, I yeah, mean, that... and, they, and they never pulled it off the books then. Just like right. in the state of New Jersey, it was finally rescinded, I want to say within the past 20 years, that recently, a motor vehicle law saying that if a vehicle was going slower than 20 miles an hour or thereabouts, it had to be preceded by a person swinging a red lantern. Yeah, and that law And that was, was still on the books yeah. up until fairly recently. If you were going under 20 miles an hour, legally you had to have somebody walking in front of you swinging a red lantern. They finally rescinded that. And I know a cop that wrote some, and I think you know the same cop who wrote somebody for that one time. I was, guy was mouthing him off, and he wrote him up for not having a man proceeded with a red lantern. So crazy laws are on the books. Well, it's, it, it, the idea behind that law is, is a safety issue, but it made sense at the time. But a lot of these laws are out there. There are laws out there that are so old you blow the dust off them, and people don't realize they have to rescind these laws. You just make them and never get used. So. This is probably one of them. It, this probably made, for whatever reason, a certain amount of sense at the time, and now it's just ridiculous. All right. I guess that wraps up Lobster Tales for this week. What do we have next? Well, uh, speaking of ridiculous, the lottery jackpot got to a ridiculous, a ridiculous place amount. this week, and the fever over the lottery got even more ridiculous. So, of course, as a in true Washington Post fashion, uh, one of the writers uh, actually, hits, I guess this was uh, the Associated Press that actually ran the story, but it was basically, hey, don't get cocky. It's not as much money as you think it is, even though you're now a member of the top 1%. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. We're talking two hundred thirty million dollars is a lot of money, no matter what you do. Well, you know, they're talking about like all the things that it's difficult for them to afford. Well, if you want to buy a box at, if you want to buy a box at your favorite baseball stadium, or you want to buy an apartment in New York, if you want to become a philanthropist, basically, once you've done three of those things, you're pretty much completely out of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. What if I want to buy a fifty thousand dollar house somewhere and live on the beach for the rest of my life? Yeah, I mean, that, the two hundred thirty-six yeah. million dollars will do that. Yes, Very easily. exactly. That's a, that's actually what uh, he said. Put it another way, it's nineteen thousand dollars a day forever, and even your one third share in that is pretty sweet. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, and the, the the funny part about it is that well, I know somebody. I know I didn't win. I know my family didn't win. I know a lot of people. My job didn't win because people showed up at work. So I told one guy, "You'll know when I win. You won't see me here anymore." Yep, that I was so funny going on Facebook the next day. Everybody said, "Well, I'll see you guys at work tomorrow." <laughs> that was the running. That's how you knew. No one we know won because everyone said they're going back, so they're going to work. <laughs> one of BaseNet's Facebook followers posted this morning that he enjoyed his three dollar cup of coffee at Starbucks or something with the three dollars he won in the lottery. Yeah. So he he actually won three dollars. So he enjoyed well, his that's bad. cup yeah, of coffee. At least he won something. Hey, power to him. That's he got awesome. a cup of coffee out of it. Accepted that I am not going to be one of those people in life who comes into easy money. Well, Tuesday I get I get to go to Atlantic City to lose. I'm not even gambling. I just going to lose. <laughs> that's what most people do. That's why you go. You guys, I'm going. How much can you afford to lose this month? And that's it. Well, you know, that's where statistics actually comes in very healthy. You can learn ways to increase your percentage of winning, which is interesting. There are several uh, applications you can use to help you with that. But, oh, me uh, and Fred know somebody that knows all of those statistics and can guarantee you're going to come away a huge winner in Atlantic City. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Or a huge loser and oh, have to hide the rest of your life. Depends upon whether you listen to him or not. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on your, your skill at statistics because you have to be able to do it very quickly in your head, which is the hard part. But, yeah. you know. As far as the health issues go, Holly mentioned that, there's a study out 
that was done by the University of California in San Diego. I know, Holly, you're probably going to like this one. I know my wife loves it. But it says regular chocolate consumption is linked to leaner bodies. And what they're saying, the people that use uh, uh, regular chocolate consumers, and I'm not talking about pigging out every day on chocolate, seem to have a seem to have leaner bodies than people that don't. And I don't know why that would be, but... You know, they gathered data on about a thousand adults, both male and female, and none of them had any known chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular. They did. You know, when, when they checked the body, they seemed to have leaner bodies at the end of the study. So that's pretty cool. So Hershey's is helping us out. Well, I think you know they say. I, I mean, obviously, the good thing about this study, and this is what I love, Fred, is that these these scientists are not in any way connected to any chocolate company. That makes me very happy because it makes me believe there might be something here. But you know, there are antioxidants in chocolate like many other things, but the problem with the study is they definitely said that they accounted for the fact that, that you know chocolate's very high in saturated fat and things like that. So you definitely have to regulate your consumption. And as you said, it's about the frequency, not the amount at a time. So you know, limiting your intake on this front is also apparently very valuable. You wanna eat it often and in very small doses, which I think is wonderful. That sounds and that, delicious. And that's like anything else, though. I mean, you can't you can't eat 800 uh, Big Macs and be and be thin, but you can have Big Mac a week. Go to Burger sure. King, have a, a Whopper a week, and it's and it, and it may help you because there you know there are but that but that food is gonna you know it'll we see the obesity studies every day that if that's all you eat. So if you eat chocolate all the time, you're gonna wind up getting fat. So. Well, I'm going to go ahead and insert here, Fred, that I disagree on one condition, on one front on that, on one part of that argument, which is this is, chocolate has some redeeming physical qualities. Most oh, of the food at BK or McDonald's has none. Nobody's done a study that says if you regularly eat French fries, you're going to be better off. The truth of the matter is that is not the case. And, yeah. it's, and it's not. The only advantage that we have with McDo places like McDonald's and Burger King is that, and I found this when I'm traveling, that as, as crappy, for lack of a better word, the food might be, it's equally crappy cross country. You can get om you know basically, and I mean basically what you're getting. Like we discussed in another show, when I was a kid, my parents would take us out to McDonald's as a treat. So it, we never had the regular consumption. I still don't go out that much to eat a lot of a lot of that stuff. I may go out every so often, but you know, unless I need fast food in a hurry, I'm going. I'm going to eat a regular meal. I just I don't think that stuff's food at all. I mean, although I have to admit, I've been you. you sometimes you get to a place where there's just not another option, and that's a that's a sad place to be in. But. But yeah, there. I mean, I'm happy to hear about chocolate. I think it's a delicious uh, study, and I will definitely keep my eye on it on that front. Uh, here in Missouri, we've had some interesting things happen uh, in the last week. Actually, Missouri Senate has now given first-round approval to a bill that will allow employers to not have to pay for birth control for their employees. And, of course, the problem with this you know, there has been a lot of talk among the last year or so that there seems to be a trend in more conservative governments towards basically de taking rights away from women. And the birth control the birth control trend has been seen by a lot of analysts as a part of that movement. Is that you know it used to be just a part of your regular health insurance, and it's getting it's becoming more and more difficult for women to get the health care that they need as a part of being a woman. I thought this was very interesting, especially in the light of what's been happening in the Supreme Court this week. Well, yeah, and I agree with you partially because what happened that insurance companies should be able to subsidize the birth control. I don't maybe say pay all of it. I mean, just like they don't pay all of it in a lot of things. But what's happened is that we've had problems where a man can get more than one prostate PSA exam a year. A woman can only get one mammogram paid for, and that's not right. I mean, I have no problem with the insurance company splitting the cost of birth control, whatever the situation is, in half or 75 percent. I mean, but I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable, though, with the government paying for 100 percent of it. Well, you, can, you can't get generic that, stuff for $5 a month. Well, it's not the government who's paying. It's If that were the argument that was being made, it would be a very different thing. The argument is that they're actually allowing, they're making the argument that employers should be able to refuse to include birth control oh, no, health insurance coverage that their employees are paying for. 
No, 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 not at all, not at all. I, if, if if you have health insurance, then and that in my opinion, if you have health insurance, it should be health insurance. I mean, if you want to go on birth on birth control as part of and, and that's part of health, they should help cover it. I mean, absolutely, without a doubt, they should. And whether it be twenty five percent, seventy five percent, fifty percent, or whatever the situation is, there should be that should be partially subsidized by the insurance company through the employer. How you know, telling people that we're not that, that's just stupid. Telling people that they that they don't want the insurance company to pay for it is stupid. Yeah, it's just it's a, it's a very interesting debate that people are having about specifically that they've cast light onto birth control because the the issue is, and this is this is where I actually take issue with it more than on being. I do, and the only reason I would feel this is an anti-woman issue is this reason. Men don't have any repercut. You know, depending on it doesn't matter what you believe religiously, men don't have any physical repercussions for the amount of, you know, anything that could happen to a man from having sex with somebody is covered under health insurance. Nobody's debating that. Nobody's saying, well, you know, if men get a sexually transmitted disease, that shouldn't be paid for under their health insurance. Nobody's having that conversation, but they're frequently going after birth control. And I sort of feel like, listen, if, if it were equal across all boards, I would still say this should be covered for both sexes. Because the truth of the matter is it, there's no way to eat to make it equalized. And since there's no way to make it equalized on all fronts, it should just be included and not – it's something – if you have personal issue with it, then you can opt in or out of it. You don't have to get on both sides. I mean, you know, you want to buy a condom, you have insurance, let them pay Let them help pay for it. If you have a vasectomy or as a man or to whatever, let the insurance company pay for it. Let them pay at least even part of it because that's important because if – it, it, people may be more likely to use the birth control method if, if the cost is less. Now, Walmart does help out with generic birth control for $5 a month, but you have to get the prescription. I think – and the, the office visit should be covered as well. Walmart's going to get $5 a month for it. I think they, they, should be, they should be applauded for it, but the insurance company still – they can't find that. It absolutely should be included in insurance. Absolutely. Because, and like I said in another show, if I'm paying the premium, I should be able to cover anybody for anything I need. That's what I'm paying the premiums for. I'm paying them. It's my insurance. I, I agree completely. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how, how this shapes up nationally because we're definitely in the time. One of the first times they say that both sides of the – both parties have been trying to change health control – health insurance and health you know health reform basically both both sides of the aisle have been trying to make health reform in this country for over 50 years and this is the most headway we've ever had has been in the last few months so for everything else that our congress and our government whatever complaints people have at least they're trying to do something that has been 50 years coming down the pikes i'm i'm proud that this debate's even on the table right now and that people are talking about health care reform and i think we'll talk about it more probably on this show as it gets as it goes you know as it Evolves, I guess, is the term I'm looking for. Boy, I'm rambly today. <laughs> well, on that front, I guess I'll move on to the other uh, Missouri local story that we had this week. It just turned out this was kind of a big week for Missouri as far as interesting stories are concerned. Unfortunately, a project engineer working on a bridge here in Missouri over the Mississippi River actually had the crane that was holding him, the, the aerial lift, actually slipped off of the barge it was on and fell into the river and he was drowned as well, and basically the entire system got drug under the water, and it took him more than 24 hours to find him. You know, the Mississippi River is notoriously quick-currented, and, you know, obviously there's been several famous stars over history, Jeff Buckley being one of them, who drowned in the Mississippi River. But, man, for an entire lift to go down and get dragged under for more than 24 hours, that just blows my mind. And what gets me is I love when they say that they're going to bring much better equipment, hoping to get more details of what's in the water. Come on, people. I mean, this guy's working on a crane in the Mississippi River, what they call it MoDOT, project engineer, that these guys, the efforts were called off to 4 p.m. to find this guy. We understand what happened. Experienced divers go in. You can't see anything in the, in the river. This stuff is prevalent in these industries that they use the cheapest and least expensive. And I understand the idea of saving money, but they're using equipment. Once the equipment fails or something happens, they bring in more expensive equipment you should have had in the first place. They had to go in 30 feet of water, and, they, and a diver went down to 30 feet of water, couldn't get into the records to help save this guy. And that's just insane. So MoDOT here in Missouri, that's, a, that's an acronym for Missouri Department of Transportation. So this guy was working in a public position, trying to do something for the city, for the state, and it just devastates me that he could be in this kind of danger on the job. 
and there's no, you know, there's no way that, that the state of Missouri can't say that they didn't know this kind of thing was a potential. This is just unconscionable this would happen, and nobody saw this coming ahead of time. And now they want to get better equipment. Why didn't you get better equipment beforehand? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, you know, I've, I've worked at a ropes course camp. I've worked at rock walls. I've worked at places where people are suspended. You check your equipment every single time you go out of the gate. There is a protocol for checking every single rope, every single carabiner, every single harness, every single wire. I mean, everything you're going to use gets checked the day you go out before one person gets on that equipment. And a barge with a huge lift on it should be no exception. That's just that just breaks my heart that this had to happen in order for them to replace this equipment. I just thought it was a story that needed to be covered and something that people need to know happens and give the tax dollars you need to give to your state to get this sort of thing working and support your local government when they make choices to protect the people who work for your state because this is this shouldn't happen. The fact of the matter is the state should have the best equipment available all the time because of budget cuts this kind of stuff happens not acceptable. It's so true. Well, we should move on to a lighter topic. You want to talk about April Fool's Day? April Fool's. April ah. Fool's. The show really didn't happen. <laughs> it actually didn't turn on the recording equipment. <laughs> he just, uh, he just gotcha. April Fool's all of us. <laughs> gotcha. I'm still waiting for Patrick Duffy just to show up in the shower. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Tell him, she, tell him we dreamed the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> The man from Atlanta. Anyway, getting into the story here about April Fool's and while we're having such a good time, it's always celebrated on April 1st, and the name was given to custom playing practical jokes on friends, sending them goofy gifts. It's been going on for a lot of years, and we Ed wanted to add, wanted to find out why it was going on, so we had the uh, we we looked it up. Well, the and there's a little location it, where it it's a order. calendar site. It's a calendar site, and uh, so what's your find, Larry? Fool Day is called April. It's not always called April Fool Day, but All Fool's Day. There's no real first that can be pinpointed, but well, I think, you know, why I not? think the lobster got the closest actually to finding the original origins. Uh, in France, apparently, when they switched over to the new calendar, apparently they used to have New Year's on April 1st. And so if you didn't do New Year's at the real January 1st New Year's, you did at the old April one, people would say, oh, April Fool's on you. That's not really New Year's anymore. Well, and that's because in, in I think, 1563, on the adopted new count of the, the King Charles IX decreed January 1st to be the first day of the new year. Now, why he would do that, I don't know. Maybe was, maybe he wants some drinking on New Year's Day. But, I mean, whether it be April 1st or, new, or, or January 1st, that, like you said, that, you know, when people who didn't adopt that would call April Fools, and I get that maybe the, adop the adaptation of the name. Why the jokes? Well, why not? Well, and it seems like every country has some version of them. You know, there's uh, there's Poisson d'Avril in uh, in France and Scotland. They have April Gox, where apparently they stick things on, they they do things to the back of you, which I don't know how I feel about that. Apparently, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. It just I, I'm kind of glad I don't live in Scotland. Well, you should do that in school. We put signs in the kids' back. Yeah, that's they kick me. Well, yes, they say that kick me is one of the things, but they say that the, that they actually celebrate April Fools for two days in Scotland, and one of them is to vote. Well, that's just an extra day to get drunk. You can't get drunk no, enough well, in one day. I'm sure, but a big part of it, and this is the the bad thing, Ed, is that people are getting drunk and then they're playing pranks on the posterior region. It says any prank on the posterior region. Yeah, the kick me sign is probably the mo the most tame if we know this. Well, you kick, you know, kick and run. You don't want to get caught. <laughs> No, but no, you, I don't think you understand what I'm saying about this, <laughs> and maybe it's best. <laughs> Whereas in England, they, they limit the, the tradition to a morning time, and then if someone plays a trick on you, you call them a noodle. Yeah. <laughs> you noodle yeah. you. Yeah, which is interesting. And then apparently, actually, this is going to tie into a story we're going to talk about later, so I think we should mention it. April Fool's in Portugal is celebrated on the Sunday and Monday before Lent, which, you know, we're coming up on Easter this coming week, and the traditional trick is to throw flour at your friends. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they in Mexico, it's celebrated on, uh, it's actually observed on uh, December 28th. It was a sad remembrance of the slaughter of innocent children by King Herod. It eventually evolved into a lighter commemoration 
involving pranks and trickery. So it, it's the same thing all over. Everybody just adapted, adapted a different day or tradition to it. But it's pretty cool. It happens all over the world. Speaking of things that should not be happening all over the world that do, apparently a nine-year-old Chinese girl became a mother this week? Yeah, well, it uh, the a Chinese be one of the world one of the world's youngest mother after giving a birth to a baby boy. Now, when I first read this article, I thought this was going to be out of Ripley's Believe It or Not. But the unnamed girl was brought to a a hospital in China, and I'm not even going to probably pronounce the Chinese name. But she was northeast in the northeast end of the country. She went and when she was eight and a half months pregnant. Now, in China, as in the United States. Having sex with nine-year-olds is illegal, so at the time they hadn't found the, fa- the name of the father. But she's not. They, but she, they say the girls are reaching puberty, the age of puberty at at long earlier levels. I mean, the youngest reported mother in the world, and the most uh, bizarre of all young pregnancy cases was a five-year-old of Peru who gave birth to a six-pound son named Geraldo in a cesarean section in 1939. I mean, that is just insane. I thought I, I thought it'd be great for April April Fool Day to put this up, but this is not a joke. This is apparently legit. Uh, totally traumatizing. And the worst thing is, is it, as we looked into this a little bit further, it looks like girls this young have had there are different incidences of this all across the the world. This is becoming more several. prevalent now. Yeah, well, because of obesity, they're saying because of childhood obesity. Because for those of you who don't know, when you become uh, obese, it changes your hormones. It actually sort of upsets your hormones and it increases some of the hormones that are linked to things like the menstruation cycle. And so they're saying that they think girls are actually reaching puberty earlier because we're fatter, quite frankly. The thing is that in this province in China, sex with a child under the age of 14 brings an automatic rape conviction and a lengthy jail sentence. Well, duh. But yeah, I mean, that's why they're trying to find this guy. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, the parents aren't discussing it, which is good. There's a Chinese hospital that in, uh, in China, in Shanghai, recently said about 30% of the abortions are on school-age girls. I mean, what the hell are they doing over there in China? Uh, this, this is not something I saw while I was there. I can't answer that for you. <laughs> oh, you were there. You should have Ooh, yeah, but I wasn't there in this way. It just, that's for well, sure. no, I understand. I'm just saying, but I mean, it's just, I mean, that would, I, I'm, I'm hoping that something like that doesn't, doesn't happen here because, I mean, nine year old girl giving birth to a child, that's just insane. No, it is. And I, I just think it's crazy. And I mean, I guess speaking of insanity that's going on around the world, I guess we knew that Venice was sinking, but we didn't quite know how. You can see this from space. Apparently, Venice has started sinking again. They thought it had leveled off, and now we're losing as much of about an eighth of an inch a year, which is more than researchers previously thought. And not only that, but one side of it is sinking more than the other. The east side is actually sinking faster, so it's tilting, and they were actually able to see this from space, which I think is unbelievable. It makes a lot of sense considering that the city is, surround, is, is surrounded by water. But, but the time that they came up with all this, it was a combination of GPS, satellites, and Matt Venice and its lagoon were drifting over the decade between 2000 and 2010. Two to three millimeters are at 0.8 inches a year. The south side, like I said, is, is subsided at three to four millimeters. The city's going on the water. I mean, in 20 years, it'll be down three inches. What do you do with something like that? It's there's nothing. I don't know if there's anything they can do to stop it. I hope they can. Well, you know, they have this system put into place to control this that they built, you know, years ago. The MOSE is what they're calling M O S E, and it's allegedly supposed to kind of balance the sea rising and and uplift, you know, Venice, and it pumps seawater underneath it and all this. Uh, well, and now they're they're looking at a way to pump seawater. Sorry, that's a different project underneath Venice to lift it up. But I mean. Just think about what if this doesn't work? Move the then hell out. The real estate is going to become a lake. Yeah, that's the same. That's it's crazy. the same. It's part of the same thing that we're ha- the uh, uh, to, to a different extent. The same thing is happening to to New Orleans, which is now below sea level. I mean, you in New Orleans, and you look at the waterway, and you see the ships above you going across uh, through Lake Pontchartrain. That's because the sea level there is reclaiming the ocean here. It's everything's being reclaimed by the sea level, uh, and it's happening, and, you know, who, they, who knew this 300 years ago when they were building these houses? I, well, see, that's the question. You know, Venice is one of the world's most, I, I guess you would say, historical cities. You know, it's so much that happened there over time. It's got great long history. It's an old city, but so I just, I, it's sad to think that all that history, even though I didn't 
really enjoy Venice that much when I went, is just sinking into the sea. Maybe you should have. Yes, maybe I should have. It's called, I the, it's called a natural to... evolution, and there's not much man could do about it. That's it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Nothing we can do except go back and next time enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what about all those pigeons? They make it awfully hard. <laughs> so many pigeons in Venice. <laughs> so I guess, you know, now we're getting into, we just had a ton of weird news this week. And this one for me, I think, tops the weirdest of weird. Neuroscientists are apparently arguing over the discovery of one man who, a UCLA neurosurgeon by the name of, and I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sure, it's Koch Fried. Basically, while That's operating on it. patients, people have to be lucid when you're operating on their brain. So while operating on patients, he said, hey, do you mind if I show you a couple of pictures? And he showed them pictures of celebrities, normal people, and Jennifer Aniston. And apparently, <laughs> every person... I, I like how she doesn't fall into either the category of normal people or celebrity. It's just <laughs> and Jennifer Aniston. Well, apparently not. Apparently, when people see a picture of Jennifer Aniston, no matter what, there's some neuron that goes off that begins to flash multiple times, and it doesn't happen for any other celebrities celebrities and it doesn't happen for any normal people so apparently jennifer aniston is an alien that's what i've decided yeah but they that's also say that, that that other ones go off for other people that other neurons in the brain go off when other people's uh pictures are shown that the brain certain triggers certain neurons are triggered when you see a picture of Jen, jennifer aniston or someone else so it, it it's an interesting article but who cares i mean why is that important and why would why would they study that well, they basically said that what's important about it is, you know, I, they said since then, since this original study, they've tried it on a couple of other people. And essentially, they said certain celebrities apparently acquire special places in our brain and that when that neuron flashes, it connects to other other feelings or other patterns in our brainwaves. So and or whatever it is that happens up there. So apparently what this is what this is showing people is that there there are certain areas of the brain that connect to certain characteristics in certain people. So apparently this wasn't as dumb as I originally thought it was when I read it, but it is still pretty weird. It makes sense to me, but I, I agree with Fred that I think that it would be more on an individual basis. If Jennifer Aniston doesn't do it for me, maybe somebody else would. So whether it's her or somebody else, could have the same effect. I mean, it, so in theory, it makes a lot of sense. They, but it, but I think the interesting thing is that it's for him. He believes that this is, this is a gateway into sort of the connections that are made in our brain when memories trigger certain neurons. And so, I, I think it'll be interesting. Though I think some neuroscientists are saying it's a useless study because the chain happens so fast. There's no way to track it. But I think they probably used to say stuff like that about a lot of medical procedures. I thought, I think that's interesting. So, yeah, they think it's going to lead to things like the difference in the way men think versus to women, the difference in how we interpret dreams, where memories form, how we learn, what's the difference between schizophrenics and autistics. And I, I think it'll be, I mean, I think it's a good gateway study, but I still think if I was having brain surgery and someone mentioned Jennifer Aniston to me, I'd be like, that is your problem. <laughs> yep. I think I would probably curse. <laughs> Well, apparently, Khloe Kardashian Odom is uh, quitting PETA. You know, she has famously posed nude for PETA. She is a huge advocate for animal rights. But she basically said PETA stepped across the line because they flower bombed uh, Kim Kardashian. They flower bombed her sister. They dumped flour on her at a public event. One, and, and PETA, apparently, the activist who did it, her name is Christina Cho. And she's the sister of the woman who worked with Khloe when Chloe did her nude shoot. This woman dumped flour all over Kim Kardashian and when Chloe said, listen guys, I'm an advocate for you. Our family works really hard to do good things for you. They said, oh, we stand behind our activists. She's, she's a great activist. She does wonderful things. And so Chloe Kardashian said, well, I'm not going to support PETA anymore then. And you know what they should I mean? It's nothing against PETA. And for those people who don't know what PETA stands for, for the, it's people for the protection of uh, ethical treatment for animals. The idea, the, the idea that they want animal rights, make sure that, he, that animals are treated humanely, and it makes sense. And they should be. But instead of going after Kim Kardashian, 
or going after Chloe or losing their support, which is very, very important to these organizations and standing by their activists, they should be going after people. They should be going after humane laws. They should be going making sure that the ASPCA gets there, get, gets taken care of. Because you know, in New York, if you if you ever watch Animal Cops on the Animal Planet, it's these people are un, are, are very losing a lot of funding they're not making and these people are actually taking care of animals it's good to say we want ethical treatment for animals and talking about them not being used in the lab experience which is which is which is absolutely where we were all at they, they got people out there that are abusing animals i don't see you know peter coming after those people in legal actions i see them flower flower bombing king kardashian which got to be the single stupidest thing you can do i joke about people about peter being people for you know eating tasty animals and yeah okay fine it's a big joke but peter has got in some areas has a very bad reputation because they're supporting what they think are good causes and yet we still have animals being out there going abused in very few states like you know like new york and houston whatever these people are going out un- almost unfunded and you've got people like Kim Kardashian who are, are going to help you out, are willing to support you, her and her sister. And these people donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to help these animals out. And you people are flower buying them? How stupid does an active have to be? Amen. I think this was a dumb move on PETA's part. You know, you have a family that supports you that is stuck together like glue uh, from their public appearances, at least, that has really a lot of resources both in the public eye and as far as like money's concerned, you don't flower bomb one of them. Maybe you go to them in private and say, hey, could you fix this behavior? But you don't flower bomb one of them in in public. That's just, that's nonsense. It's just ridiculous and there's no reason for it. And it's so and, stupid on their part. And Peter should, and Peter should have, just told the activists, look, you got to back down. You can't be doing this because it gives – when they say we absolutely support our people, it means we support them no matter what they do. So if they start firebombing homes, is that okay too? I mean yeah, exactly. if this girl had firebombed – if she had firebombed Kim Kardashian's car, would that have been okay? Because they say they support their activists, and God forbid that should ever happen, but – you know, it's a stupid statement they made. They should have chastised this woman, apologized to Kim Kardashian. Now Chloe and Kim don't support them anymore. Yep, and I mean, I'm sorry, but if there's one thing that that we've learned in the past few years, it's that Kardashian dollars they work. The Kardashian Kardashians are everywhere. They're on the cover of several magazines just this month alone. And when you have an advocate like that in your corner, you don't forsake them for somebody who's dumping flour on people in public. That's just a silly, silly move. So I, I'm with you, and I think that's upsetting. But you know, but I thought it was important to cover it because it's hilarious and also very, very stupid on their part. <laughs> so I guess we'll move in. I guess we're moving into the obit. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about before we do that? Scientists are hoping to make make lab mice or lab rats, whatever you want, mice more comfy in their lab homes. If they say they're cold and not producing well, the result may be that one out of nine out of ten drugs that seem to work in lab mice and other animals unfortunately fail to work in human beings. So. They want to try to make them more comfortable so that they're less stressed in the lab in their cages while they're being tested for drugs. Okay, you know, why is, why is this girl not firebombing, uh, not, not uh, flowering these guys, but she's going after Kim Kardashian? So, <laughs> you know, I mean, how stupid do these people have to be? I, I, could just, I could just hear this lab mouse saying, oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Well, for me, I mean, I think it makes perfect sense because, you know, anybody who's, you know, John, my husband, has worked in clinical research, and there's been a lot of proof that if people can continue their daily lives, the more comfortable they are, the more able to do the things that they want to do, the longer they stay alive, and the more effective their treatments are. And the reason they're saying that most treatments that are tried on lab mice don't translate to people is because the lab mice are placed in an unnatural situation. So it makes perfect sense that this would make things work better. But I just wonder, like, if truly the the percentage of things that are tested on lab rats actually, or lab mice in this case, uh, work work for humans, is if it's so low, then why not do this some other way? Is there no other way? I don't. I'm so stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anyway, enough of that. Well, let me just tell everybody where they can find our fine programming. You can go to uh, BasenetTV.com, and at BasenetTV.com you will find links to all of our shows, including this show as we see it, and the Crashing Glass podcast, and Viewpoint, 
and everything else that we have coming up soon. And I want to remind everybody that between now, officially now, April 1st and June 1st, we are going to donate 20% of any donations that BaseNet receives to the Jimmy Fund, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We will make a presentation of any funds that we get at their Scooper Bowl event in uh, the first week of June in Boston, Massachusetts. So if you go to BaseNetTV.com, right up at the top, there's a donation button. Click on the donation button, and you could donate to BaseNet TV programming for as little as $1.00. Yes, we will take a donation as low as $1. These are non-recurring charges. You could donate only once or you could donate whenever you choose to. And come the first week of June, we will donate 20% of whatever we've received between April 1st and June 1st to the Jimmy Fund. You could find us on social media, at, uh, Google+, Plus. we're BaseNet TV, Facebook, BaseNet, Twitter, BaseNet TV. That about does it for me. Nice. Well, I guess we'll go into our obit today. Um, you know, as some of you know, and I uh, and I'm going to go ahead and give a plug here. With you know, I I write occasionally on a website called WearItBright.com. I have been a runner. I've run Boston and Providence and a couple other marathons. I'm doing the Go Half Marathon this year, and my husband and I both wear uh, Zebram Five Finger shoes. The the barefoot movement as it is today was kickstarted in this country by a book called Board to Run, which chronicled the exploits of a runner by the name of Micah True, who was known as El Caballo Blanco, the white horse, if you will. And he is an extreme running genius. The man is notorious just for being able to run hundreds of miles without stopping comfortably. And basically his proclivity for running barefoot or in uh, these sandals that were made by a South, uh, a South American tribe are legendary, literally legendary. The book Born to Run is all about them. And his body was found this week in New Mexico. He had gone out for a run. He was staying at uh, New Mexico's Gila, near New Mexico's Gila National Forest at a lodge there. And he went out in the morning, and he went out in the evening rather at around 6 p.m. for what for him would have been a very routine run, about 12 miles. And they found his body in the wilderness. Apparently, he knew the trails very well. There's no evidence of foul play. They don't really know uh, yet what the cause of death was. But he was a man who, as they say, followed his bliss. And I would say, I would add to that, he followed his bliss for hundreds of miles. And he will be truly missed by the running community. It's certainly a, it's certainly going to leave a hole. So, Micah True this week uh, at the age of 58. And I guess that does it, guys. That's a. Uh, our sad o bit for this week, and I guess we'll talk next week. So that wraps us up for another show, for show Very good. 36 of As We See It from April 1st, 2012. So from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. And from the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Bowes. And from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. We'll see you next week.